Hello viewers, and welcome to yet another Warhammer 40,000 Conquest video production. My name is Mitch, and I am the Hive Tyrant. Today, I'm pleased to present you with still another installment in my continuing series of Community Spotlight videos, in which I interview various prominent and upstanding members of the Conquest LCG community. In the past, we discussed guests' favorite decks and how very best to pilot some of their preferred warlords, but now that I've completed an initial interview and guest analysis for each of our first 14 warlords, I now look to assess and explore the thus far spoiled warlords of the upcoming Planetfall cycle of war packs. So, expect a discussion that's steeped in theory, conjecture, and at times pure speculation to be sure, but hopefully through guests sharing their impressions and opinions, all within the context of hundreds of games worth of experience, they'll nevertheless be able to provide you with a wealth of information useful to both new and veteran players alike. Be sure to let me know what you think of this interview in the comments section below, and as always, I remain ever open to constructive criticism, but with our introduction aside, let's get things started with the discussion of the upcoming Subject Omega X 62113. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, but before I ask you if that's an ovipositor in your pocket, or if maybe you're just happy to see me, why don't you introduce yourself and let our viewers know how you happen to be involved in our Conquest LCG community. Hey, my name is George Tinkum, and I just actually started playing Conquest uh, several months ago. I got into it when a friend of mine, Alan Jones, came over and introduced the game to me. And since then, I've just been completely hooked on the game. It blew my mind with the amount of depth involved in it. And I joined the Facebook group, and I saw Anthony Dulac bragging on the rule book. And I, I just thought, you know, after reading the rulebook, that this was the best rulebook I've ever read in my life for any game. And I, I just couldn't stand it. So I started saying some stuff, and he got really upset about it. And Charles Smith saw what I was saying, told me I was his hero and everything like that. Made me very happy. Sure. And then, uh, you know, Dulac deleted everything, and... It started his little reign of terror, and a couple of days after that, you know, uh, the, new, the new group formed, and since then I've just kind of been trying to post ideas about the cards in the game and just theory craft as much as everything as I possibly can and just expand my skill. Uh, I have a long history of playing games, and I think this is just a game I could easily play for the rest of my life as long as they continue to produce cards for it. So I just see myself trying to be a proactive member and contribute as much as possible. Sure, you almost strike me as a, a somewhat different version of myself. Like, we both started playing the game at around the same time. The major difference between the two of us being that instead of spending hours and hours and hours creating videos, you're actually out there playing and uh, really starting to achieve that masterful level of skill. So I definitely admire you in that right, and I uh, certainly agree that at least to me, coming from the Lord of the Rings LCG and some other games, uh, the rules reference guide is uh, relatively immaculate by comparison. So, you know, you said you've been playing Conquest for just a few months now, but what was it that drew you in in the first place? What was the initial appeal? Well, uh, when I was a kid, I played a Warhammer 40k, so when they initially announced uh, Conquest, I was uh, immediately drawn to it just from the intellectual property. But due to real-life reasons at the time, I just never bought in, and then it turned out nobody in my local area was actually playing, so I just avoided it. But once I finally found somebody to play and I demoed the game with, I just loved it. the skill trees... The decision trees that you make in this game, there's just so many variables, and it's beyond any 
individual card strength, it just feels like the better player will just about win the match every single time. Well, I suppose I'll definitely agree. It doesn't seem like it leaves much up to luck or any sort of like random element. Uh, just the sheer number of decisions that have to go into each and every round, it just seems like it's absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, but is there any like anything in specific that really keeps you loyal to this game? I mean, it's a hell of a thing to say that you could consider yourself, uh, you know, see yourself playing this for the rest of your life. Uh, just the spatial element, you know, like like I said with. Uh, I played Warhammer 40k when I was a kid. I played War Machine and Hordes, and just being able to move your units around in this game really gives it much more depth than a traditional card game uh, like Magic. So that that spatial element, along with the command struggle, just creates a very unique game in of itself. Definitely. Uh, certainly a lot of different layers of strategy going on. Like you mentioned, you know, the spatial element, what you're deploying where, the order that you're deploying things, the striking difference between the command phase and the combat phase, yet they're both so important. Uh, kind of the cat and mouse elements, the bluffing elements, all sorts of different things just all kind of come together to make this an absolutely fantastic game. But I've got to say, relative to tabletop 40k, I definitely don't miss uh, rolling the buckets full of dice. But, uh, you know, George, very much appreciate your coming on here today. At this point, doing these community spotlights, this interview series, I've covered the entire range of our first 14 Warlords, the core set said and done long ago. The Warlord cycle at this point is starting to be old news. We haven't quite broached the Great Devourer yet, but we've started getting a number of intriguing preview articles for the Planetfall cycle of War Packs. So, out of all the different warlords we've seen thus far, both you and myself were particularly excited about our third upcoming Tyranid warlord, but why exactly would you or any other player want to choose Subject Omega X 62113 as their warlord of choice? Plain and simple, it comes down to mind games. A big aspect of this game is the ability to actually deceive your opponent and outmaneuver him. This Warlord capitalizes in on that. It's very possible if you have your key planets infested to hit the deploy phase and just immediately say pass. And then what does your opponent do? He has to play into it or go somewhere else. But if you're, you know, it he could make a decision that completely causes him to lose the game. Sure. If he's not careful, especially in the opening rounds with the predation to his planet, and then he can either fight your Gene Stealer Prowler or eat a shield, and then you could hit it with a lethal toxin sack and swing for five. Right. I suppose uh, combat tricks in this game are so sweepingly powerful at times, and just like you mentioned, uh, because... Subject Omega is able to ambush so many units into play, your opponent basically has to answer what it is that you put on the tabletop with this, you know, tremendous fear in the back of their mind that at any point you can kind of react in kind. So I just think being able to see exactly what your opponent has done by the time it comes down for you to put out some of your most dangerous units is just staggeringly powerful. But uh, I suppose are there any other defining features that make Subject Omega stand out beyond the Swarm Lord, beyond Old One Eye, as like a particularly appealing Tyranid Warlord option? Oh, he poses a very different style compared to the other Warlords. Whereas you actively deploy the Swarm Lord at a planet to generate his ability at the planet that you actually want to be affecting. Sure. And the old One-Eye is a very aggressive Warlord. This Warlord is very much able to sit back and just snipe at planets 2 through 5 and never actually put himself 
in a lethal situation, yet his ability is always there. So he offers a very different play style of not having to actually put yourself at risk. And if you're against a warlord, maybe like Anchi, who could punish you for going to a planet by yourself, you can still always put him at a, a well-defended planet and also use your ability at a planet that you're still not at, which is usually a hallmark of a, of a very strong warlord, is how frequently do they get to use their ability. Sure. I mean, it's definitely fantastic just having so many different options. You know, unlike somebody like uh, the community favorite Colonel Strachan, he doesn't have to be sitting there putting himself in danger in order to derive that benefit. But, you know, we've certainly kind of started touching on this, but what do you think is just the absolute greatest strength, uh, the most compelling reason to run Subject Omega? It's going to be his ability on himself, just playing up. Ambush is one of the strongest mechanics in the game. If I remember correctly, when Steiner P revealed the two MVP cards on his database, sure. it was Eager Recruit and Clavex Warleader. And Eager Recruit is a very simple card. It's just a 2-1, but it can come in at any time. And when you're allowing that for hopefully... You know, even if it's just 30% of your army units, you know, it just, it's game-defining. Well, I mean, it most definitely is, and we've seen spoiled from one of the Planetfall preview articles you mentioned earlier, that Gene Stealer Prowler, uh, for the same cost, so long as you do manage to infest planets, that's identical to an eager recruit, and it has that additional, you know, uh, HP value, so... It just seems like the possibility there is absolutely enormous. And just because Ambush is so powerful, because Subject Omega doesn't have to be sitting there at whatever planet you're deciding to ambush units into play, do you feel like there are any specific matchups where, you know, our Broodlord really excels and really just uh, shows how incredibly powerful that ability can be? Yeah, I would say Eldrath is a huge one. Eldrath is a warlord that really wants to go into a fight knowing what he's going to get into. His units are not durable, at least in the common builds of Eldrath. He's not there to do prolonged fights. He really likes to get in, hit first, and win. Subject Omega X, he doesn't know what he's getting into. Um, another warlord that's probably not going to like this is Zarathur. Zarathur is a very fragile warlord, and at that point you're effectively causing him to deploy to planet one to defend himself with his army at all times. If he ever goes out by himself, it is a, a very lethal situation for him. And if he finds himself in that situation, there's not too much he can do. Well, I mean, it's definitely an extraordinarily dangerous prospect for any relatively fragile warlord. You know, when you mentioned Eldrath Starbane, something I thought about is if you hold on to your most valuable units uh, and you're not actually putting them into play during the deploy phase, they might not even be sitting out there on the table for Eldrath to exhaust them. Or if Zarathur's using the gleeful Plague Beast, which just seems like a nightmare to the Tyranid player, if you don't have units in play, at the beginning of the combat phase, they're not taking that global damage, whether or not it's amplified by Zarathur. So it definitely seems like just an extraordinarily strong ability for him to just be able to, you know, sit back and kind of sinisterly take in all the other information present on the board before you decide exactly what you want to do. It just seems like such a fascinating control option for the Tyranid player. Yeah, and a major strength to it is it prevents you yourself from over committing to take an objective. Um, and that could be a big thing in this game, especially against somebody like maybe Space Marines, whose a large strength of theirs is their ability to send units at the planet that you're fighting at during combat. You know, with Eager Recruit, Drop Pod Assault. Well, 
Subject Omega X does the exact same thing, and he's never stuck in a situation where he's committed more to a planet to win it than necessary, which really allows him to fight at other planets more effectively. And that's a, that's a huge part of this game, is that if you're causing your opponent to also, they themselves, to over-deploy to a planet because they don't know what's in your hand, it, it's just, it limits them in so many tactical possibilities. Well, definitely... I suppose, uh, you know, just in regard to how you're constructing a, a deck which is piloting Subject Omega, seeing as how the Tyranids don't have any ally options, maybe just to start off, what uh, Synapse unit do you think would work best, coupled with him? Well, I think there's three Synapse units that uh, stick out in my mind, and one of them's going to be a little controversial, and I'll get to that. The first one is going to be the, the Lictor, Stalking Lictor, is going to be huge with him. Getting more resources, drawing more cards in the command phase so you can play more during the, the combat phase is, is going to be huge. Definitely. Um, blasting Zone Throat, I think, could actually be very good with him because you're going to want to infest as many planets as quickly as possible, and having a free Ragnar ability is nothing to scoff at. Um, and... The third one is actually the Venom Throat Polluter. And that's going to sound a little strange considering he's been hit with the most, uh, I guess, favor. <laughs> um, is that once you've actually deployed your Gene Stealer unit and used him as a combat trick, maybe you need to get him somewhere else on the next turn up front to Planet 1. Right. Because having this Gene Stealer down at Planet 4 isn't going to do you any good when you need to nut up at Planet One. Well, something that strikes me as potentially very appealing about the Venom Throat Polluter being able to relocate those units is, at least from some of the Gene Stealers we've seen, they don't necessarily have, like, a huge command presence. So it just seems all the more important that you're really getting the most value possible out of them. Like those Prowlers with their no-printed command icons, if they're just sitting off in some, you know, backwater planet and doing absolutely nothing for you, it could be of paramount importance to actually get them back into the thick of combat. But apart from Synapse units, what are some other just deck inclusions that strike you as, you know, strong or even mandatory? Um, I would say my favorite unit out of the whole Great Devourer box is Hunter Gargoyles. And I would have to test it to say for sure. Machine Stealer Prowlers and Hunter Gargoyles, but I just love that unit to death. It, you can deploy it at Planet 5 and go to Planet 1 if the opponent sends too many guys there. You can capture Planet 1, then go to Planet 4 where the enemy warlord's at with the predation. It, that's just a very versatile unit that for me has always pulled its value back for that one resource and one card that it took to play it. For sure. I mean, one of my favorite core set cards was the Wild Rider Squadron, and the Hunter Gargoyle seems very much like a far, far cheaper, albeit somewhat less hitting and much more squishy, uh, Tyranid option. And again, I mean, it's just such a fantastic opportunity for you to react to your opponent. And in this game, you know, the more information you can accumulate prior to having to show your hand, as it were, the better off you're going to do. So uh, definitely nothing in the Great Devourer box set has made me quite so giddy and enthusiastic at the prospect of playing the Tyranids uh, quite like this Warlord has. But what are some of your other strong contenders? Um, volatile Pyrovore. I, I don't care what Tyranid deck you're making. I think it's going to be a long time before that card will not be included as a 3 up in any <laughs> tier in a deck. It, it's it, just... Uh, it does strike me as slightly powerful. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly powerful. It's one of those cards that requires more resources from your opponent to deal with than it costs you to put into play most of the time, bar in a few circumstances. Sure. And I suppose even if your opponent has some nice, like, uh, counter to it, if you want to call it that, they're still expending cards that may or may not deal with it permanently. 
I mean, something that strikes me as particularly powerful is even if your opponents invested, say, during the previous round in using, like, an Archon's Terror to temporarily get rid of that volatile Pyrovore, if you are opting to run the uh, uh, Venom Throat Polluter, it's entirely possible that you can kind of reel that Pyrovore to exactly where you need it, so it just definitely strikes me as an awfully strong deck inclusion to be sure yeah um other cards that i i value uh is going to be regeneration uh that's probably going to be a three of and a tier in a deck for a long time as well just you if you think about it as uh two free shields a turn on a unit it certainly seems a lot more appealing than what you might think when you initially look at it right uh, a card that I think of that will pull a lot of weight in the Subject Omega X deck that is not seen too frequently, otherwise, is Spore Chimney. Because there's something to be said for getting the planet you need to be infested, infested. A lot of the times with my current experience with Tyranids on Octagon has been me getting planets infested, but there's not that absolute certain control. Sure. I mean, with Spore Chimney, granted, you've got to wait until the headquarters phase, but just having that point-and-click uh, guaranteed infestation, you know, as many rounds as you keep that support in play, certainly strikes me as uh, having fantastic potential to ensure that you're set up exactly how you need to be when it's going to count most. Yeah, and there's something to be said for reliability in this game. Um, there's a lot of times where some cards are kind of chancy, and I, I don't, I don't really prefer those. A card that I have not been enjoying too much is actually Toxic Venom Throat. Even though it's a two for two command, I, I really feel like it suffers from like the Eldar Survivalist Syndrome, and when you don't have as many command cappers and one for ones as other factions, and you, it's it just uh, it's a huge uh, liability. It's a big target of opportunity for your opponent to attack. Sure. Well, I mean that seems kind of a, a natural way of progressing into my next question, which was, what do you think some of Subject Omega X's greatest areas of weakness happen to be? I mean, the command phase was certainly. Uh, an initial bit of an eyebrow raiser for me, like an area of concern. But what do you think his vulnerabilities are, or his just overall weaknesses? Somebody with better combat tricks than him um, is going to be a big deal. And off the top of my head, I, even though I was mentioning Space Marines earlier, I think that could be a, a fairly well-off matchup. I think they would end up playing fairly similar, but I think Space Marines might do what he does better naturally. Uh, just the ability for Drop Pod Assault to pull a multitude of units from the deck into play can just, from Honor Librarian to Blood Angel Veterans, I don't think we've seen a unit of that caliber spoiled with a Gene Stealer trait yet. Sure. Another thing is somebody that could completely dominate command i think kith might be a, a tough matchup because he's going to be very dependent on winning the command struggle um other tyranid decks might be a problem well in in what sense i could just see swarm lord posing as a huge problem for any other tyranid in the mirror match just because they do not have the strongest aoe capabilities sure and i I suppose from the uh, gene stealers we have seen, which are kind of few and far between at the moment, uh, they're definitely more erring on the side of expensive and elite type units. Yeah, um, so th th it's going to be a big deal. I think their cost around the fact that digestion pool is a thing, and you're going to kind of be forced to run two, maybe possibly even three just to get that out there so you can, you know, combat trick an invasive gene stealer in for one. Right. So resources is going to be a big deal. 
because he could find him you could find yourself in a delicate situation where you need to play units for command and then get blown out in the command phase and not actually have enough resources going into the combat phase and that could just be a huge li liability but also a great strength for him is that a lot of warlords would have to sit back on the deploy phase sure well, I guess one of my initial thoughts, one of my initial concerns was just by merit of holding on to a lot of resources, you might, you know, be ultimately depriving yourself of having a bunch of units on the tabletop going into the command phase. So you might be, you know, maybe you're faring very well in combat, but you're missing out on raking in a lot of additional cards and resources that if your opponent is able to claim those instead over the course of the game, that could ultimately turn out not so great for you. Uh, I just think so much of this hinges upon what additional Tyranid cards we see, and addition, uh, most definitely what additional Gene Stealer cards we see. Um, even some of his like greatest combat tricks, if you ambush an elite Gene Stealer into play, I think if your opponent, you know, you mentioned opposing combat tricks can do an indomitable or some convenient means of kind of dashing your most devious plots and schemes, uh, that really sets you up to be in a, a pretty crappy position indeed. Yeah, uh, another thing is is how telegraphed he is at the start of the game. Um, because he does require a planet to be infested, to actually have work, um, it, it really telegraphs what he's capable of doing during turn one, turn two. So you have to be incredibly careful with him at the start of the game. And I could see a huge weakness to him is actually if the flop is a planet one, two, three, you know similar colored symbol alignment that could win the game very quickly. I find it, I think he could be a very strong mid-game warlord, and if you just find yourself in a very rushed-down situation, I don't think he could hold up too well compared to some of the other warlords in that situation. Sure. I mean, definitely <laughs> the first planet or two that ends up with an infestation token on it, it's like this giant... Uh, you know, beacon, uh, warning your opponent to stay as far away as possible. Um, but just considering that bit of a slow start and maybe his kind of unusual balance between uh, how much you want to play during the deploy phase versus how many resources you want to save going into combat, how do you picture him just playing relative to some of his Tyranid fellows? Like, what might be your initial first few rounds look like in regard to just basic strategy and just setting yourself up for success? Well, I could see a very just golden hand with him consisting of an invasive gene stealer, a scything hormigant, a termagant century, and a ripper swarm. That that would probably just be one of the straight up better hands. Uh, the invasive gene sealer would end up being deployed at a planet to kill a rogue trader or any other one cost planet capper. Sure. Um, and that would just give you a widespread. I would, depending on what planet one is where it was, would be where I deployed the scythian hormigant. If its alignment was uh, with a quick victory, I would definitely send him there. Otherwise, I would send him to a planet that had a battle ability that the opponent would really like to trigger. But in my experience with Tyr Tyranids, Taurus has been a terrible planet for the enemy to trigger. Because they will trigger it almost every single time. If you control fewer re units than your opponent... You can gain three resources or three cards. And as a Tyranid player, if your opponent commits their Warlord to that, they're probably going to trigger that almost every single time because you start with that extra Synapse unit in play. Right. So I, I often find in my games that I end up defending that. So getting an Infestation token on that planet as soon as possible is definitely huge just to make your opponent really consider committing to that planet for that battle ability. 
another big one to watch out for would be the discard a card planet. Um, I can't think of its name off the top of my head, but that is uh, that could be a big weakness for him as well as obviously going into the combat phase, anything in your hand presumably is a trick. Right. You're going to have very few dead cards with him. Right. I mean, in, unless you're holding on to a bunch of supports or something like that, pretty much everything is usable, whether it's ambushable or it's shields. Uh, and certainly as we see more and more useful gene stealers, that's only going to become all the more of an issue over time. Yeah. Um, so you, you're really going to play a much more defensive style with him, which sounds kind of strange. But you're really going to want to corral your opponent and just say, hey, you can't come here, you can't come here, unless you're prepared to deploy a bunch of units to defend your Warlord. Um, even if they just commit their Warlord there with a bunch of guys in tow, they're going to be tapped, or, or excuse me, exhausted when they come in. So you're, you're very free to get a couple initial blows on him. It, it, so it's a very dangerous game. For the enemy warlord to play, I, I figure if you go on the offensive with this guy, you could just be setting yourself up for an early death. Um, because if you do get bloodied with him, from what we've seen of some of the Gene Stealer units, they lose a lot of effectiveness. Uh, and even though we've only, oh, I guess, only seen two spoiled with the Gene Stealer Prowler, that unit's not really worth playing outside of the fact that he's ambushable. Um, I do like about the invasive gene stealer how he is playable when he's not being ambushed. He's effectively a Sicarius chosen on that planet. But if you do ambush him, he's even stronger coming in at a 2-4. And I find that each point of health that a unit gains, uh, it becomes that much more effective. Just like having one hit point in this game is a victim stat. And having two hit points, you know, most of the units that people run are going to kill you in one, one attack. Definitely. And coming in at four hit points, considering the bad uh, number of shields Tyranids have at, at availability, that's, that's going to be big. Well, and I mean, above anything else, uh, you know, maybe uh, in a certain situation, if your opponent has one of those paper-thin one-hit-point units, you just absolutely obliterate it as soon as their unit enters play. If your opponent has to fear in the back of their mind that, you know, oh god, I have to keep my units above one HP at all times, maybe they just end up wasting a, you know, a torrent of shield cards or maybe, since you can't shield a, an HP subtraction effect, it just seems like there's so much fantastic utility to that one ability. And just like you said, you know, the difference between 3 and 4 in this game, or 2 and 3, if you look at a statistical breakdown of, you know, a unit with attack value of X kills Y proportion of all the units we've seen, it's extraordinarily you know, significant. So each and every point in this game is so valuable, and a big swing like that, even if it doesn't outright kill a unit, can just be absolutely fantastic. But just kind of out of curiosity, what's your opinion on the remainder of his signature squad? Like his attachment, support, event, what's your uh, opinion on those? The event is by far a huge blowout play that is a signature event right there um it is, it is just a huge tempo swing it puts the unit into play you get to attack with it it fits your priority to attack it is just terrifying it can take a unit before they get to gift of isha it which is huge against elder Wrath. once again i think this guy is going to be huge against elder Wrath. pulling back and I end in Wraith Guard, our Starbane's Council. It is just like, just mean. It's just mean. <laughs> right. Just thinking about this card, I can't help but smile. And, you know, granted, I've not played with it yet, but just reading it and looking at it, I, considering its cost, considering everything you just said, uh, it's definitely already a contender for favorite event uh, thus far printed. So. Definitely very excited about that one. 
Uh, but what about the attachment and support? Are those quite so powerful in your eyes? The attachment, I think, is very strong. And the reason why it's very strong and just not strong is it's ambushable. And this guy will definitely be running No Mercy. 100% he will be running No Mercy. And just being able... For three resources, able to hit the opponent's warlord for five after he snipes your ripper swarm. And he can't shield it. It's just a terrifying prospect. And yeah, it's a three-card combo, but these things happen. I mean, they definitely do. And five, you know, uh, if you're considering a gene stealer prowler, considering that you could instead use something like a Yungarl gene stealer, uh, that five suddenly stands to become quite a bit higher, and if your opponent can't use shield cards at all, uh, it makes for a whole range of very exciting possibilities. Another thing that makes this card very strong is the fact that it's recurrable. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a card disadvantage that comes along with attachments. The fact that you can deploy this from your discard pile, even though you can't ambush it anymore once it's into your discard pile is very strong in a pinch you could always use this as a three shield card and still have it for when it counts if you're in a clutch situation where there's going to be a big battle at the last planet or the last the last planet that your opponent needs to win just knowing that your opponent's warlord has to come down to a planet and there's going to be a guy with a minimum of five attack possibly even higher is just a very intimidating prospect for any warlord definitely i mean especially once the tyranids start seeing better ranged options than something like the termagant spikers considering that this doesn't need to be affixed to a gene stealer uh it has incredibly nasty potential um but, you know, it seems like the community is, is much more kind of divided when it comes to the support, the ruined passages. What's your, you know, personal opinion? It costs three. The effect is potentially very powerful. But do you think it's worth it? I don't see myself ever playing it. <laughs> if, if, there, if I'm in a matchup where the opponent could kill it or destroy it if they run... If I'm up against uh, Chaos and they're allied with Orcs, I will probably never play it. Right. Just because the huge tempo loss that you that would happen to you from having it de be destroyed. That's three resources. Um, is it is it a strong card? Yeah, but it's so projected that will there be times when it wins games? Yes. But there'll be just as many other times, especially if attachment hate, or I'm sorry, support hate becomes very strong, that it's just it's just a huge liability. You know, I, I do think Tyranids kind of have an inbuilt weakness that it gets to a, a situation where it, both sides have met for this titanic battle. Tyranids seem like they're in a worse situation than most other faction, factions in the game. Um, and this does definitely help alleviate that, but I don't like telegraphing my plays. Sure. And that's what this does. But I'm also of the opinion Ragnar's War Camp is actually a very good support, because once it's on the table, it completely changes the way your opponent is going to play the game. Well, I can certainly see that for this as well. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it, it's a one-shot effect it, it is my problem. Right. Will there be times it's good? Will there be other times it, it just, you're going to regret playing it? Yeah, it's my least favorite card. Well, and I most definitely agree with you. I think just the fact that you mentioned this is so clearly telegraphed, it kind of runs counter to everything that Subject Omega stands for, where it's that's an awfully big chunk of change that you're putting onto the tabletop. And when you suddenly go into, say, the combat phase with three fewer resources, 
even though your opponent has something on the table to fear, there's a lot less of that element of the unknown, a lot less surprise in which your opponent, you know, whether or not they're just thinking too hard or whether you've really got some solid gold in your hand, uh, you just kind of give up a lot of a lot of really important stuff when you play something just so staggeringly expensive like that. Yeah, and the, the reason why I'm dismissive of it to the extent that I am is with the spoiled cards we've seen, how, uh, how they're progressively making support hate much stronger because of things like Orbital City and Chimera Den. Um, uh, squig Bombing is kind of overcosted what it does. Sure. But, like, Clogged with Corpses, it, if that's going to become the benchmark for uh, support hate in the future, supports are going to be in a tough spot. Clogged with Corpses is, a, is just a great card. There's little to no opportunity cost to using it. Um, I think the Eldar support and attachment hate could definitely be played as if maybe a one of or a two of in certain situations. And against something like this, uh, it's a huge blowout, especially if the enemy warlord has initiative and the very first thing they do when you enter the combat phase is send it back to your hand. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not very fond of it. <laughs> well, I suppose, uh, what are some of the cards that you're the biggest fan of? Like, what are some devastating combos, those plays where when you think, you know, I want to make a subject Omega deck, these are the, you know, absolute killers that I want to be sure to get off as often as possible. What, you know, most devastating tricks and just devious things are you looking forward to someday springing upon an opponent? I could just... Oh, there's there, there's so many situations. This guy's so versatile in his, his ability to use. I mean, ambushing anything in is always going to be awesome and killing something. Uh... Ambushing in a Yimgarl Gene Stealers, especially if you have a digestion pool and play, which you should be running with this guy. Like I said, possibly even three of. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But just how strong it will be to deploy these Gene Stealers at such an undercosted rate, especially something that's hitting for six, because you're going to be deploying them where the enemy warlord at, is just a very intimidating prospect. Sure. Well, it seems like a lot of Tyranid players so far seem to be pretty fond of Dark Cunning. So if you can attack for six twice, uh, that's all the better. Yeah, D Dark Cunning is another strong card. Um, it its major problem is, and I did this one time, I obviously took back because it was an illegal play, and I think I'm just going to bring up is that I tried to play it for one resource on a game of Octagon, right. I think, the first time I played it. Uh, you can only play it for two, just to get that out there. Right. Uh, but it, it's a very strong card, and I think this guy could actually bring that card to the real forefront, because the major problem is Tyranids don't have a lot of heavy hitters to make that intimidating. The obvious dream play with it so far in the current card pool is like ferocious strengthening your synapse unit and attacking twice with them. This is a uh, it's going to be a huge card uh, with this deck, obviously, because every planet's going to be infested. Um, I'm really interested to see what other type of gene stealers. I figure we're going to get like two. Two more Gene Stealers, at least one more. If he's in the two cost range and he's just remotely decent, just I'm not even talking about Snake Bite Thug or Warlock Destructor levels of good for a two coster. Sure. But I think that will just really give this guy a lot of game. Just um, particularly because of like the prospect of playing it for free with Digestion Pool or just for. I mean, there's that, but cost curve reasons. Yeah. Uh, having a strong curve in this game is probably more important than anything else. You, you really need to have a balanced curve. Uh, running too many two-cost units can be bad. Too many three-cost. It's probably never a bad thing to run too many one-cost, except for the fact that a lot of them you know, are either really strong or just kind of meh at sure. best. Sure, sure. But... Definitely our current meta 
it's not the worst thing in the world if you include a lot of low-cost units, especially if they come with, you know, command icons printed on them. For sure, for sure. Uh, and I, I would like to see, uh, hopefully, a better, like, command unit for Tyranids be printed. I don't think they actually have a terrible command game yet, but, like I said, I'm not a fan of uh, Toxic Venom Throp, and... I would like another two for two in the two cost range to be printed if it was a gene stealer. Mm-hmm. Even better, because then it would probably have like some decent combat stats. You know, if it, even if it was you know a Clavex warrior, you know, just a, a direct reprint of that, I would be ecstatic to have something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, I uh, that strikes me as maybe a little strong, but you know, I wouldn't say no. Seeing as how it's Tyranids, why the hell not? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, I think every card should have powerful cards. I think, you know, if everybody just has really powerful cards and the only thing that keeps it in check is that every card is super powerful, I think that's a great way to balance a game. Uh, and this game is actually kind of already balanced around that with the top-tier factions. If, if you look at, you know, all the top-tier factions, they all have devastating tricks that can straight up close out a game if your opponent is not careful. Sure. Space Marines will hit you with the drop pod assault and an eager recruit. In fact, I did that against somebody the other night. First turn bloody. It just happens. Uh, Eldrath has Gift of Isha. Uh, Kith has Clavex Warleader, which is, I believe, the only games, the game's only straight up true two for one. Off the top of my head, I mean, I guess outside of board wipes in certain situations like that, but that's a removal spell in a game that does not have a removal card. So it's that, that's obviously why it's so strong. Um, so the more the one thing I have noticed about Tyranids when we're talking about dark cunning is their tricks are a little bit on the weaker side. It costs two resources for what it does. If it was in Space Marines, it would probably cost one all the time, you know? Uh, sure, sure. Um, they, they also have a lower shield count. So this guy is going to be very much a situation where he wants to hit first, you know, uh, and take your opponent down. Any protracted battle is probably going to be a dangerous situation sure. for these guys. I mean, hopefully hit hard first and then you know make that the last swing of the entire battle uh i suppose just a a card that stands out as potentially very powerful to me um depending on how the command phase works out is i was thinking consumption might not be the worst thing in the world just because your unit count could potentially be so low if you do manage to get a lot of infestation tokens in play like you mentioned predation if your opponent kind of has to have something in a lot of different places potentially you might be able to punish them with that but at the same time i could see if you've got you know it's not like you're going to have termagant tokens filling the board or something like that for you to just throw away so i guess i could see that card really going either direction um, yeah, com- consumption's a very uh, iffy card. I actually had a situation where it was used against me uh, the other night, and it actually blew me out, um, which was the first time I'd seen it happen. But it does happen, and, and I would probably consider to find a way to include it, at least initially, mm-hmm. uh, as like two copies. You know, at worst, it's always one shield. Because when the situation that it does work is just very devastating, um, it's a very powerful effect. And I could potentially see yourself in a situation where the game is not going favorably. And even though you still might have your spore chimney out giving you the infestation tokens, your board maybe has been overran, certainly by somebody like Kith or Tau who are, are very strong in the command phase. You know, also, I guess, Eldorath. They, they just... So, in those situations, I think consumption is indeed very strong. Um, so, I haven't cut it from any of my decks yet. Well, especially for my... I think I actually cut it from Old One-Eye, but it's still in my Stormlord deck. 
Um, I, I myself have not had the dream situation where I've got to play it and just laugh at my opponent who got destroyed. Uh, but one counter for this guy I could easily see is your opponent deploying everything to one planet. Right. It's not infested, and that can be a, a, a tough situation, uh, especially if there's like a lot of void pirates there. Uh, hopefully, I guess you would get the... Yeah, the virulent spore sack uh, to bust that planet, which is a uh, another favorite card of mine in the Tyranids. Just a combat action, one damage to the entire planet can be huge. Sure. Uh, and it drops off that infestation token in the middle of combat, which seems pretty much perfect. Yeah. Um. The good thing about this warlord, though, is that it really puts the onus of responsibility into the opponent's hand not to make a mistake because he's one of those guys that can just straight up close out a game if you're not careful. And that's always strong. Um, the, the the downside to him, though, is that if he gets bloodied, I could see him losing a lot of effectiveness. Um, and that could... But I usually don't play the game in the prospect that I'm going to get bloodied. I, I'm usually fairly conservative with my Warlord. I'm, I myself describe myself as a very aggressive player. And I will force combat, I will force tricks out of my opponent's hand. But the one piece I don't ever do that with is my Warlord. Because so many decks in this game fall apart. Uh, I'm actually primarily an Eldrath player. And once Eldrath is bloodied, I feel like his whole deck just does not work anymore. Uh, the whole Eldar archetype is kind of based around the fact that when you come into combat, the opponent's most dangerous unit to you is going to be tapped or sent home with an Uh, You know, so... And this guy, if you do find yourself bloodied, his deck also kind of falls apart. Because now you're running Gene Stealer Prowlers, who aren't any good without being ambushed. The invasive gene stealer is still potentially powerful, but there's still a lot of room left to see what the design space for their units are going to be. Um, if the two drop is competitive without being ambushable, I think he'll be in a good situation. Um, I don't like to run too many cards that are conditionally strong. I'm not a fan of a lot of the Swarm Lords cards sure. that are designed for him in the box because they're only good in such a situation that you have a ton of Termagants or that you have this big death ball, and in that situation, you're already winning. So, like, the Termagant Spikers that you mentioned before, they don't have a command icon. You know, they're just... I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of Termagant Horde either. For my three drops, I'd rather run, you know, Tyranid Warriors or Virulent Pyro... I'm sorry, uh, Volatile Pyrovore. And I think that's going to be a big deal on this guy, too, is when you're in deck construction, is to make sure you're running cards that are good, but that also play to his theme, but not cards that only play to his theme. Well... I think a big question on the forefront of everyone's mind, really, with each newly revealed Warlord is, do you believe that uh, Subject Omega has the potential to be competitive, one of our perhaps top-tier Warlords? Absolutely. I think he has the basis right now to be uh, very threatening and just not a, a casual, fun Warlord. Uh, and I will also say this, there's not too much of a difference between a lot of the warlords on this scale, there there might be of competitiveness. You know, there might be a consistency thing. Um, I could see this warlord being very consistent though, uh, with proper deck building. Infestations not a not a very hard thing to do, especially if you're including spore chimney. You get that guaranteedness that the plant that you need will be done. His tricks are devastating. A hallmark of this game, like I mentioned before, is having devastating tricks. Uh, and he definitely brings that out. Most definitely. Um, so, will he be Tier 1? I don't think we've seen enough of his cards to say for certain. But I think with what we have right now, and the cards that we uh, 
know of that will be released in the pack, he's definitely easily tier 1.5. Sure. Um, like I said, it really is going to come down to that. If there is a two-drop gene stealer, how competitive it is without being ambushable. Because if it's something like Gene Stealer Prowler that you can only play and being ambushed, I'm not going to find uh, that probably playable. Or if it is playable, Gene Stealer Prowler won't be playable in that situation because you don't want too many units that kind of do the exact same thing. Definitely. You want a variety in your units. Um, and that's actually one thing I like about... The Tyranids is it seems like um, they're not stuck in a situation that a lot of other factions are. A lot of like Eldorath has a lot of just command cappers in my in my opinion, and very few just straight up combat units. Tyranids are kind of on the opposite end of that spectrum, where even their dedicated units in some situations are combat. units or combat units like Tyranid Warrior, even though people have kind of not given that too great of reviews in the, the release, sure. that's a unit that caps planets, but when it's time to throw down, also throws down right. very well with the 2 four stat. Um, so I'm going to be playing this guy, even if nobody else is playing him, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> well, definitely. I mean, at the very least... I'll be there with you in spirit if I'm not too busy making videos to actually be playing the game. And uh, just because I can't let this video run its course without speaking my my point here, I just think it's incredibly flavorful. Like the Tyranid Warrior in the tabletop iteration is just, just supposed to be like this pinnacle of flexibility and versatility. It can have, you know, any manner of different biomorphs. So the fact that it's good during the command phase, it's good good during the combat phase is awesome. Earlier when we were talking about the volatile pyrovore, that's a very cool model, but it's absolutely wretched on the tabletop, so it's fantastic that it gets like a new uh, choice at life in our card game here, so there's scarcely been a single Tyranid card that's gotten me half as excited as Subject Omega here, and with his signature support being the exception, I think his command squad is absolutely fantastic. But uh, just as a means of kind of bringing things to a close and winding this video down, for players running up against Subject Omega, what do you think is maybe the simplest, most straightforward means of standing a chance at besting this, you know, spoiled Tyranid Warlord? Obviously, at first, he's going to be avoiding infested planets. As the game progresses and he has more planets that are infested, just play very defensively, and which is actually probably ultimately his strength as well as that he forces your opponent to play in a style that they're not used to, kind of like how on Chi. You're going to have to assume that at any given time, he can kill you. Sure. If you don't have an indomitable in your hand or just, you know... Like I said, he's going to be running no mercy. I don't care if you drop three shields. It's it's just it's not going to happen. He He's very good at selectively removing pieces. And I could definitely see one of the few strategies that are effective against him is just those planet one death balls, <laughs> you know, right? and just keep moving forward. But even then, if there's the other night I was in a situation in a game where my opponent did that and... They, they had done the consumption to me. They completely wiped out my board presence. And all I really had was my warlord and, like, two other guys. And I ended up dropping my guys off at a, at a plant further down the line that I wanted to fight at later on. And then during the next commitment, I sent my warlord to the same planet as the enemy death ball. But because everything was coming in tapped and it was my initiative... I was going to get the first attack, and I just did that to the enemy warlord, and then I ended up being hit by, like, one other unit, but the enemy warlord was bloodied, so he had to actually exhaust him and run away, um, and I just did that, and it allowed me to actually win that game, because the enemy warlord was in a situation where, when it came down to the final planet, they were coming down there, and it was my initiative again, 
and I was able to put him in a situation where I was going to kill the enemy warlord before he got to do anything because I had put that little bit of damage on him. Uh, so I don't know what that has to do with anything. <laughs> but playing against this guy, I would say play incredibly safe like you do against Anshi. Don't take any chances. Otherwise, it could close out the game. Always assume it's the worst possible situation. Um, I tend to do that in all my plays, but when I play against other players, is I always assume they have the Indomitable, the Clavex, the Drop Pot Assault, or the Gift of Isha. But the th I try and do is I try and get them to do these actions before it really counts. I try to create as many little battles in the game as possible. I don't give anything away for free. And you probably want to do that against this warlord as well. You don't want to wait till there's a situation where you can't commit your warlord to an area and he has to go to an infested planet and his hand is full of gene stealers out, is out there. Try and bait him out beforehand. Um, you know, don't allow somebody to get a grip full of combat tricks and then go to the big battle and then be upset that you lost because they had way more combat tricks than you. you got to flush those things out is another thing. But never risk your warlord doing it. Well, definitely some sage advice there. But before we close things down, any last thoughts, anything you want to get off your chest or just throw out there? final pieces of advice or tips, little nuggets of strategy? Never quit. Never quit a game until you're dead. That's one thing I see a lot of people do is they once the game starts going against them, they'll kind of give up or they'll just straight up scoop. Never, ever do that. You can always catch back up in this game unless your opponent is in such a situation where they are just a way more developed player than you are. And usually you can tell that by the end of the first turn, not the first command struggle, because some decks are just designed to win the command struggle. But I've been in situations where I've had opponent completely dominate me in the command struggle, but through clever use of my abilities and commitment to my warlord and deployment of my units, even though I lost the command struggle, I was able to do something in the board state to catch back up later in that turn. Um, and you can always, always come back in this game. Um, there's very few situations that you can't. I, see, I know I've kind of said that before, but it's just hammering at home. Don't scoop. You have to learn to play from behind. This is one of the few games where you can actually do that. That's why a lot of the resets are very conditional. It's not just a straight up reset the game. Yes, the opponent does get an advantage, but people make mistakes. Don't pretend like you're hopeless. Uh, a lot of people will think, will actually telegraph that they don't have tricks, that they don't have shields. Don't do that. This game is defined by the combat tricks. Sure. I mean, it just seems like when you're talking about not giving up early, if there's any warlord that I've seen that very much rewards you for uh, waiting and waiting and then enormously capitalizing upon your opponent, leaving themselves situationally vulnerable, maybe the game could be just a complete blowout. But if you're able to ambush a unit in at the right time and score a kill on your opponent's warlord or a bloodying or something like that, the damage that that could inflict to the opponent could be absolutely devastating and turn things right around in very short order. So I, you know, can scarcely agree enough with you just in regard to persevere, you know, wait, and then when the conditions are right, it's entirely possible that you could come back. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of people put themselves in a battle that they really wanted to win or they felt like let's say they were in a situation where they had won planet one planet two and planet three is the victory for them but the opponent now has been dominating the command because they've been so focused on planet one and planet two and then just go all in on planet three against their opponent 
and just like, well, he has so many more cards and resources than me. Don't you know? Even though they have no chance of winning, or it's just fifty-fifty. Don't bank the game on that. You know, you got a huge advantage with these two planets. Try and secure your victory now. Uh, when I used to play StarCraft competitively, there was a there was an idea in the game that comes across as if you have the chance of the game or secure your victory, always go with secure your victory. Um, and that's usually why you'll see people expand to a new base in that game, if anybody's familiar with StarCraft, compared to just straight up closing out your opponent. Because throwing a game away is it's just... It happens sometimes we get on tilt, but you just really got to avoid that. Um, you know, just... Well, it just speaks to your conservative play style. You know, you don't take unnecessary risks. You don't necessarily go out of your way to be aggressive, uh, you know, in, say, making sure that you... The StarCraft example, it's like making sure you don't overextend yourself, uh, making sure you can maintain control of what you have as opposed to potentially leaving yourself vulnerable uh, to your opponent and you know it seems like that very much speaks volumes about subject omega here where it you know rewards players for kind of lying in wait uh waiting in the darkness for their opponent to you know wander by and get caught entirely flat-footed and just pummeled and shredded into oblivion so Absolutely. Uh, th this is a guy that will uh, proper play with him will ultimately taking away choices from your opponent and slowly forcing them to do something that they don't want to do to survive, but they have to. And hopefully during that situation, you know, you gain something worthwhile. Um, if you're investing key planets, now they can't go to them. If you're sending your war warlord to a planet to trigger battle abilities you know there's uh that they can't go to to fight you for there's just a lot of a lot of strong elements to this guy that really take away opportunities from your opponent and it within your hand you know what you have and your opponent doesn't and you can always be assured that you're in a situation that you're going to win or if you're not going to win, you know to get out because you know you can keep adding stuff. And your opponent doesn't exactly know how much you can add until your resources are gone. Um, you know, there's that whole uh, Sun Tzu quote of don't go to war seeking victory. Have found victory first before you go to war. Something along that line. So I'm pretty sure I butchered it. <laughs> I'm not a poet. But... You know, that's going to be an essence of how you're going to play this warlord and the state your opponent's going to be in. If he goes to a planet that's infested, he's going to have to go in there expecting the worst. And if he's expected the worst and deployed more than you can handle, then you know just not to go there. <laughs> like, that's, that's a very strong element to this guy. Sure. Is that he allows you to be conservative when to be conservative, conservative and aggressive, when to be aggressive. Right. Well, he certainly provides a wealth of information in any regard, and no matter how exactly you're choosing to play him, uh, considering just how powerful that knowledge can be, uh, he just still strikes me, even after an hour and change of talking about him, you know, I'm I'm probably even more enthusiastic about him than I was, even if I've probably got a more realistic perspective about things now that I've really let him kind of sunk, uh, sink in and just assessed him from uh, every initial dimension possible. But uh, I suppose before I ultimately wind things down here, any final closing thoughts you'd like to share? Anything else you'd like to get out there? I just want to give a shout out to the community at large as being one of the best communities for any game I've ever met. And that's just not to go out to the online community, but up here in Nashville or down here, I guess for some of you, there's um, there's not a whole lot of people that play, but the people that do are extremely friendly. Uh, I got into this game very late in the competitive season, and I went down to the Atlanta regionals and... I saw, I've met all the people down there, and every single person there was 
very friendly, a, a high caliber individual, and I don't think I've seen any community for any game as a whole just have just like some of the most standout individuals that just really want this game to succeed and become popular and just so enthusiastic about it. And maybe it's the game as well that just makes people want to be like this ecstatic about it. But, you know, uh, I think if as long as everybody just, I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but everybody kicks ass that I've met in this game in real life and online through Skype. That's all I can say. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, it definitely speaks volumes to the caliber and quality of the game when, you know, even if you're losing, it's hard to stay too mad just because the universe is so uh, engaging, so fascinating, and the mechanics of the game are just so uh, rich and immersive, and it demands so much, like, mental uh, investment. I can just always scarcely say enough good things about this game, but uh, I suppose before we're here for too much longer, we might as well end the video here, but thank you so much for coming on, George. Very much appreciate your time. Obviously this was all very much steeped in speculation. Who knows? Maybe we'll see some cards that turn him into complete garbage, but I think it's probably pretty unlikely at this point, and I'm very enthused still about the possibilities with this warlord absolutely and thanks for having me on especially for my you know stature compared to some of the much more esteemed <laughs> individuals that you've had on your program thanks and i appreciate it and i would love to do something else again in the future not a problem and i'd be happy to have uh, have you back on but thank you so much and have a fantastic evening yep you too buddy Well, with our interview having ultimately drawn to a close, I'll just conclude this video by saying thank you once again for watching. Be sure to leave a comment sharing your own thoughts, opinion, perspective, and experience when it comes to speculation regarding not just Subject Omega X 62113, but the Planetfall Cycle Tyranid Faction as a whole. Interaction with viewers like you remains the absolute highlight of my creating content for this channel, so I implore you to please take a moment to let me know what you thought of this interview and which warlord you'd like to see covered next. If you know someone that would make a good candidate to guest star in a future video, by all means feel free to share. But with that said, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel if you've not done so already. If you are already subscribed, please consider sharing this video, as the more eyes there are on this content, on this video, on this channel, the more potential new players we might draw to this game, and as a result, serve to ever expand our growing Conquest community. Please feel free to contact me directly or keep in touch through any social media outlet you'd like, but in any case, thank you very much for watching, and be sure to check back in again soon for ever more Conquest LCG content to come.